your mercy. Your mercy taught us how to dance. We'll celebrate all we have and we'll dance to thank you for mercy.
The will of the Lord for his children is to
are open, miracles are in this place. Hearts are mended, grace is extended, miracles are in this place. Lord, we want you, no one else will do in this place. Chains are, chains are broken, eyes are open, miracles are in this place. Hearts are mended, grace is
somebody reach over to your neighbor and touch them. Say your miracle is on its way. I believe in the name of Jesus. Wait no longer. Your miracle is here for you. Oh, yes. If you have pain in your body, just reach your hand up. If you know you need a miracle, reach your hand. He said, reach to me and I will extend my love.
overflow of the presence of God in this room. I believe we're still reaping from fasting and prayer. And as we continue to do so, God touches. We seek after his presence. We seek after his anointing and his power. I don't know about you, uh, but I want to talk to us about this morning. I hope I can get through the, the whole concept of it. But really, we, we are in a pursuit. We're, we're, we need to be passionate. We need to have a passion for his presence. I think sometimes we get too comfortable. We don't have that same passion that we, we once had. I don't know why. Other than the fact I got a couple of reasons why I think that happens. I think part of it just has to do with the fact of our familiarity with it. We don't take it and treasure it nearly as much as we did the first time. So his presence is here today and I want us to pray one more time. We're going to ask God just to touch us in the next few minutes here. I don't intend on being very long this morning, but I hope to get a message across. Before we leave here today, we can seek after his presence one more time before we walk out of here today. While we're praying, remember uh, our ministry team, they're in Carthage uh, as we speak right now. So remember them as they are ministering in Carthage. Brother Joe Jones told me this morning his dad, they were here not too long ago, but his dad has gotten a revelation of Jesus' name, baptism. Yeah. He's 78 years old, and he's going to get baptized in Jesus' name. And uh, and he just leaned over to me and said, I'm just seeing him coming up out of the water speaking in tongues and getting the Holy Ghost. I believe it can happen. Amen. There are too many examples of it. We know that it can happen, and so we're going to pray that God will touch that. And uh, it's good to see the Allen and his family. But remember, the McCormack family today lost his father this week. And um, just remember that family in their time of loss. But let's pray one more time. Ask God to touch us here today. Lord, in your precious name. God, I thank you, Lord, for your presence that we feel here this morning. God, I thank you for your power and your authority we feel. God, I pray, Lord, that you'll touch us in the next few minutes. God, anoint my lips. God, anoint my mind. God, to deliver your word. God, I pray under the authority of your name, God, your word that is already anointed. God, I want there to be a passion, God, for your presence, God, that just emanates from me, God. Lord, I pray for each one of these needs here that we've mentioned today. God, I know, Lord, that you can fill... God, even at 78 years old, you can fill with the gift of the Holy Ghost. God, I pray, Lord, that you would touch in Jesus' precious name. We give you the glory and the honor for it in Jesus' name. If you will just remain standing for me to read two scriptures, and then you can be seated this morning. Psalms chapter 69, verses 8 and 9. It says, I am become a stranger unto my brethren and an alien unto my mother's children, for the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. The reproaches of them that reproach thee have fallen upon me. I want to read it to you again from the New Living just for sake of some clarity here this morning. But verse number 8 says, Even my own brothers pretend they don't know me. They treat me like a stranger. Verse 9 says, Passion for your house has consumed me. <laughs> and the insults of those who insult you have fallen on me. And then John chapter 2 and verse 17, it says this, his disciples remember that it was written, this statement, the zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Again, in the New Living, it says, then his disciples remembered this prophecy from the scriptures, passion for God's house will consume me. Passion for God's house will consume me that is my desire he said you know what whatever ridicule fell on you let it fall on me because here's what i want you to understand though my family 
puts me to the side. Though my family acts like they don't even know who I am anymore. Though I get disowned by friends and by other people that I may come in contact with. One thing is for certain. A passion for your house is going to be the only thing that consumes me. I'm not looking for fame and I'm not looking for glory and I'm not looking for... I'm looking for a passion that will consume me in your house. Nothing matters like being in the presence of God. Nothing is more important than being in the presence of God. Hallelujah. And so I'm going to ask God just to help us for the next few minutes. You can be seated. The word zeal in that scripture means an enthusiastic devotion to a cause or... Uh, an idea or a goal, a tireless diligence in its furthering of that goal or idea. It is an interchangeable word with the word passion, which means an ardent love, a strong desire, or an abandoned emotion. There was a black church in Kansas City that had this as their slogan. It was wake up, sing up, preach up, pray up, or pay up. But never give up or let up or back up or shut up until the cause of Christ in this church and in this world is built up. I'm not going to back up. I'm not going to fall back. I'm not going to take a step down. We're going to continue to push forward until what God wants done in this community is done. You probably don't know him, but in parts of India... Uh, of India he is very famous. His name is Amar, and I'm not even going to attempt his last name. Just go by Amar. One day in 1973, Amar decided to raise his right arm 90 degrees in the air. He claims that he has not lowered it since that time. So for all of this time, and when this story was put out for nearly 30 years, Amar's right arm remained extended upward. Recent pictures have showed uh, this Indian man to reveal that his fingers had withered into the palm of his hand and his knuckles had turned white and began to rot. His fingernails had grown long and twisted. And when they asked him why he constantly keeps his arm raised, he explained it is a gesture of devotion to the Hindu god Shiva. You've probably not heard of Lotam either. It's another Indian citizen. Lotam was an Indian uh, sadhu or sadhu, which is a holy man. And he accomplished something that can only be described as simply bizarre. Because over a period of eight months in 1994, Mr. Baba rolled his body 2,485 miles, 973 yards, from the city of Ratlam to the city of Jammu, India. He averaged 6 to 11 miles per day. Some days he rolled as many as 13 miles. <laughs> they call us holy rollers. While rolling, he did not eat. He only sipped water and occasionally, watch the holy man, smoked a cigarette. But upon finally reaching his destination, a religious temple on a 5,000 foot mountain, his blistered and calloused body finally stopped. When they asked why he rolled across India, he explained it was to pay homage to the goddess Vashino Deva, Devi and, and to achieve peace and unity for India. Literally rolled his body up a 5,000 foot mountain, 2,485 miles. What is it that caused these men to sacrifice their jobs, their home, their lives, their very existence, if you will, to pursue what could only be considered as a trivial pursuit. But was, it, was it money? Was it fame? Was it some kind of material possession? The presence of maybe a gun to their head? What is it that caused them to do that? The thing that motivated them was pure passion and zeal for their cause. That's simply what drove them. See, passion is what separates the men from the boys. Passion is what separates the women from the girls. It's what separates the prayers from the players. It's what separates the intercessors from the interferers. 
Passion is what separates the contenders from the pretenders. It's what separates the complimenters from the complainers. Supporters from the reporters. The reporters who are having to constantly broadcast what is wrong with the church. See, passion separates them. A passion for his presence is what the body of Christ has to have. It's the very thing. It's what we must acquire. It is something we must pray for continually. Passion is what separates us. Passion is what separated Mary and Martha. Martha was more worried about the setting, but Mary was only worried about sitting at the feet of Jesus. Martha had a passion for the work of God, but Mary had a passion for the God of the work. Demas and, Tip and Timothy. Demas forsook Paul when the allure of the world became too strong. But Timothy, Paul said this. He said, I call to remembrance your unfeigned faith. Passion is what separated Cain and Abel. Cain tried to slide by with a half-hearted sacrifice that cost him nothing, but Abel was willing to shed blood in his worship. I'm going to tell you something this morning. When you have a passion for Jesus, you're willing to lay on the altar anything that would distract you. I talked about it a few weeks ago about the different altars, but understand something. A passion on the inside of you is what's going to separate you from those who just partially want to give God something or those who say anything that comes between me and my relationship with you, I place it on the altar. God, I want you to burn it. God, I want to get rid of it. I don't want there to be. It's passion. Separated Cain and Abel. It's passion that separated Saul and David. David was a man after God's own heart. He was a man who sought after the presence of God. No matter how many mistakes he made, no matter how many times he got it wrong, he desired to be in his presence. Saul, however, was a man who sought after his own agenda. Passion is what separated the rich young ruler and the disciples. When he left sorrowfully, Jesus turned to his disciples and he asked him, he said, will you go also? To which they replied, Lord, where? Where? Where would we go? We have sold out everything for you. Where am I possibly going to go? It's what separated Judas and Peter. Judas had never found a place of repentance, but Peter repented and then preached the message of salvation. It's passion that separates it. The success stories are separated from the failures, not by perfection, not by prestige, not by talent, and not by wealth or status. They are separated simply. The success stories and the failures are simply separated by passion. Passion that keeps them at the feet of Jesus when they had a million other places we could be. But I have a passion to be in his presence. Why do Christians lack zeal? Why do the people of God sometimes lack the passion? Why do we, why do I not have the passion that I ought to have? Why is that the case? Can I suggest to you just four reasons here this morning why we lack the zeal or the passion that we really ought to have? First of all, as I mentioned just a little bit ago, we've, we've allowed something precious to become familiar, to become ordinary, to become everyday and common. We've allowed what we have here. We have allowed the things that go on around here to become something that is just commonplace. It is something that is familiar. It's just ordinary. I, I know we, we get up and preach, and I've said it before. We ought to make this something that happens every time we come in the house of God. It ought to be commonplace. I know I've said that. But we don't treat it as common. That's the difference. I don't treat it as common. I am thankful every time the presence of God shows up in the house. I am thankful every time God touches somebody. Every time I can look over and see a tear running down somebody's face. And they go, you know what? God has touched me in a way that nobody else could ever touch me. God has meant more to me than anyone else could ever mean. That's when I am thankful for the presence and the passion. Something that's become ordinary. You know, a, a marriage that has gone dry is not because one of the other couples has dried up. <laughs> because one or both of the couples have allowed the preciousness of the relationship to now lapse. It's not what it used to be. It's not like it was when we first got married and we were just all fired up, on fire and and we just, you know, we just loved each other. There was passion about us. But now, I mean, come on, we're older now. 
And so because we're older now, it, it's not the same thing. It, it's, it's just not the same. We, 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 don't, we don't treat it the same. It, it's not the same. Listen, the only reason that happens is because you've lost the preciousness of that relationship. The only reason that happens is because they don't no longer mean what they meant to you one time before. You remember making a statement, I could never live my life without you. I, I just, I wouldn't be anything without you. We make all those statements, and I don't know if we're making those statements because we're just trying to be flattering, and we're just trying to create something, you know, just this wonderful, but the reality is, I really can't live without it. But that same passion that would be allowed in a marriage relationship ought to be the same passion that I have when it comes to God. I don't know about you, but I can't go a week without being in a passionate presence of God. I can't go a week without pursuing after his presence because I need him. I can't live without him. I can't make it without him. The greatest weapon the enemy uses against our relationships is the word tomorrow. Tomorrow, I'll take the kids to the park. Tomorrow, I'll take my wife out on a date. Tomorrow, I'll take my son fishing. Tomorrow, watch me, I'll go back to church. Tomorrow, I'll live for God. Tomorrow, I'll get serious about my relationship and my salvation. Tomorrow, I'll take care of it. I can't tell you how many times I've heard young people in the years that I worked with youth that would tell me, I'm going to get right with God, Pastor. I just need a little time to go out and do some things. <laughs> I just need a testimony, they would tell me. I've been in this my whole life. I don't have a testimony of being delivered from drugs and alcohol and immorality. I don't have that testimony. I said, no, what you do have is a testimony of never having to have that happen in your life. You've got a testimony of a God that can keep you from those things. Tomorrow, tomorrow, tomorrow. We just take for granted that there will be a tomorrow. That the church will always be there. That the altar of repentance of fire will always be there. We, we cannot lose our passion for the presence of God because it may not be here tomorrow. How many stories could we share with you of people who have passed away long before they thought it was going to happen? I have no guarantees of tomorrow. And so the first thing I think is a problem when it comes to a passion or a zeal for his presence is just the, the commonarity, the, the familiarity. Just the, it's, it's just ordinary. Listen, I want you to understand something this morning. Okay, our guests that are here, thank you so much for being with us today. But every church member in here, if you've come from any other place or any other church, you ought to be able to say, you know what, there's something different about this place. Yeah. How many of you believe that? There's something different about this place. It's not ordinary. This isn't what you get everywhere that you go. It's not the same thing everywhere that you go. It's because there's some folks in here that have got a passion for the presence of God and refuse to have church without his presence in the house. I'm just not going to do it. If we're going to have church, it's going to be because God has shown up. It's going to be because we have lifted up worship. Listen, it's not a program. It's a presence. It's not just something that happens. It's a presence. And I'm passionate about his presence, about his presence. I, I don't know about you, but I, I'm just not comfortable. Man, I'm just telling you, the only good thing about a dead, dry church is that that wood burns faster. That's the only thing good about it. I'm just telling you, I don't want to sit through something where folks are just sitting there with their arms folded and they're just rocking back and going, well, just preach something to me, preacher. Say something's going to make me happy. Say something's going to make me feel good. Don't make me change anything. Just say something that's going to make me comfortable. I'm just telling you right now, I wouldn't, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be able to be in a church like that. They'd probably kick me out anyway. It becomes just ordinary to us. Second reason I think that maybe we don't have the passion we should is we have this need for approval. We all want to be loved. We all want to be needed. We all want to be accepted by others. If you want, if you want real passion for his presence, you better recognize while passion will draw some people to it, it's also going to repel some others from it. I told you a few weeks ago about that altar and about that, that Ark of the Covenant and being familiar with that presence. And you know what? If somebody else is not comfortable around that presence, I don't know if I need those individuals around me. Because there's going to be some people that it repels. 
There's going to be some people that just don't want to be around that. They just want to have anything to do with it. But you know what? I, I can't allow my need for approval or, or a desire for popularity to pour water over the fire of a passion for the presence of God. Without thinking about it, we turn the fire of passion down. We trade passion for approval. I, I, just, want to be, I just want everybody to be happy. I just want everybody to be comfortable. Listen, I'm just going to tell you, I love every individual in this room. I love everybody that calls this their church home. I want everybody in DeKalb County to want to come to church here. Okay? That's just the reality. I want them all to come to church here. But the reality is, they're not all going to want to be in church here. And that's okay. But the ones who are here, we ought to have a passion for every time we come in the house. I want to see his presence move. Let me just say this real quick. Can I say this? I'm on some medication, so I don't know who to tell what I'm going to say. Here's what I think right now. I think there ought to be some parents in the room that say, I want my children to know what it means to have a passion for the presence of God. I want you to understand something. You're not going to see me sitting back when worship is going on. You're not going to see me sitting down when worship is happening. I'm going to get up, whether it's the person I like singing or not, whether it's a song I like or not, I'm going to be up giving God praise, giving God glory, magnifying Him, because I want my children to see this is what God has done. This is why I come to church. This is why, my God, I feel the Holy Ghost. This is why I'm in his house. I got a passion for the presence of God. And let me just say it this way. You can like me or you can dislike me, but it doesn't change my passion that I have for the presence of God. Let me just tell you this. There's only one person's approval that I'm seeking after. That's his. As long as he's happy with me, everything's going to be all right. I can't allow the approval of others to put out the passion of fire that I have for the presence of God. The third thing I think is apathy. It's a word that means without love. People have lost their love. What once caused our hearts to beat faster now barely even affects our pulse. We fall into a routine. We fall into a rut. We had this conversation with our leadership. Do you know what a rut is? A rut is a grave that's had the ends knocked out of it. That's all it is. And we fall into a routine. We fall into this, this rut, this routine. And we, we become routine about our faith. We become routine about going to church. We, we don't deny Christ. We, we just demote him to a common place. Apathy is not a state of mind. It's a condition of your heart. It's not just a state of mind, it's a condition of my heart. We don't, we don't disregard him, we don't, we don't disregard his presence, we just kind of demote his presence. We just kind of demote it, it's something that, you know, I'm going to get around it, it's going to be a routine, I know what's going to happen, we're going to go to church, they're going to make some announcements, they're going to sing a couple songs, preacher's going to get up and preach himself red in the face, and then we're going to all get up and go home and go have lunch. It becomes routine to us. Apathy is a condition of the heart that is dangerous. When it comes to the passion and the zeal of a Christian. And then the fourth thing. Is that people will affect you. People will affect you. You heard the expression. Birds of a feather. Flock together. It's the same thing with people. There's a saying. That you are who you hang with. was a saying that was reminding us to be careful who we spend our time with because it will absolutely affect our walk with God. See, when you take a red hot poker out of the fire and you throw it down on the cold concrete floor, what happens to it? It slowly loses that red glow that it has. What happens when we remove ourselves from God's furnace and we hang around the cold, lifeless places and people. We begin to wax cold. It was the warning that Jesus gave to his disciples in Matthew 24 and verse 12. He said, and because of iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. The word wax means to wane gradually. The passion doesn't just go out in an instant like a candle's flame being snuffed out when a strong gust of wind blows through. It just cools gradually. Passion is seeping out a little bit at a time. 
That's why you can come in and still feel something. There's that little spark. But slowly it seeps out until there's no more passion anymore. It waxes cold. And so what happens? What happens when passion's lost? Is it really that big of a deal? Let me, let me read something to you. Revelations chapter 2, <clears throat> verse number 1 through 7. It says, Unto the angel of the church of Ephesus write, These things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in the right hand, and who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. He said, I know thy works, and thy labor, and thy patience, and how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and thou hast tried them which say they are apostles, and are not, and hast found them liars. Verse 3 says, And hast borne, and hast patience, and for my name's sake hast labored, and hast not fainted. Verse 4, watch, this is key. Nevertheless, I have somewhat against thee, because thou hast left thy first love. Remember, therefore, from whence thou art fallen, and repent, and do the first works, or else I will come unto thee quickly, and will remove thy candlestick out of its place, except thou repent. But this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitans, which I also hate. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith to the churches. To him that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. Watch what happens in this scripture. This church was a serving church. He said, I know your deeds. It was a sacrificing church. He said, I see your hard work. It was a church that was a steadfast church. He said, I see your perseverance. It was even a sanctified church. He said, you can't tolerate the wicked men. You've tested those who say they are apostles and are not. It was a sanctified church. It was a church that was a suffering church. It said, you have persevered and you have endured many hardships. But even though you have all of those things, he said, I'm still somewhat against you because you've lost your first love. Now, wait a minute. Back up. Slow down. According to, day, to today's standards, this was a church of the now generation. <laughs> this was a church of the generation that's happening now. It was, a, it was a happening place. It had all the right stuff. Had all the right programs, had all the right things going on. What could God possibly see something wrong with this kind of church? Because, man, they had it going. It seems that the Ephesian church had the fire at one time, but it grew cold. They had left, he said, their first love. Let me just make a statement because this is a church around here that believes in servanthood. And believes in service to the kingdom. But let me make a very clear statement. Service is not the same as passion. Service is not the same as passion. It is possible to serve God without passion. Serving God, if you will, out of a sense of duty is something that is very draining on an individual. Living for God out of legalism will sap the passion out of your life. Service alone will not produce passion. Passion is a state of the heart. So let me say it to you this way. It doesn't matter how hard you try to work in the kingdom, it's not going to produce passion. Not all by itself will it produce passion. There's got to be something on the inside of my heart that is passionate about the presence of God, and that's where I want to be. Let me tell you what service without passion will generate for you. Bitterness. Bitterness. It'll generate hurt because you'll take things personal. Hmm. Let me pick on Sister Ashley for a second because it's okay. She don't care. <laughs> Sister Ashley does a great job trying to keep things clean around here for us when we come into service. She, she has everything done. She could really get bitter about y'all leaving junk laying on the floor. Some of you bringing drinks in the auditorium that are not water. And spilling and making stains on the carpet and on the chairs. Uh-oh, I done gone to meddling. She could really get upset about that. How about the crackers and the stuff that we find, the crumbs all over the seats? And don't get me started on glitter. But understand something. If she didn't have a passion for what she's doing for the kingdom of God, she would do nothing but get her feelings hurt every time she walked in the building. 
Hello? But when we have a passion for the kingdom of God, our service is emphasized by the passion that we have. But your, your service will never be emphasized without passion. Because you're going to take things personal and you're going to get upset when somebody does something you didn't want them to do. Mm. So don't think you can just work harder in the kingdom and that's going to develop passion. You better find an altar somewhere where you get a hold of God and say, God, regardless of what I do for your kingdom, regardless of how you touch me again, the only thing I want is to be in your presence every opportunity I get. Whether that's on a Sunday morning church service or a Tuesday night prayer meeting, whether that's on a Saturday, first Saturday prayer, or whether that's in the middle of my own living room, reading your word and praying before you. I just want to be in your presence. It's a passion. And so with that being said, I got eight minutes. How do I restore passion to my life? How does that happen? The Word of God repeats over and over again the importance of maintaining a spiritual fire. In 1 Thessalonians 5 and verse 19, it warns the believer, do not put out the Spirit's fire. And so the first thing that I would tell you in order to regain passion, in order to revive passion, is you've got to make sure you have a, a, a fireplace. <laughs> you've got to make sure you've got to have a fireplace. 1 Timothy 2, Paul exhorts to the younger pastor, Timothy, he said, stir up the gift of God that is within you. Now, everybody knows that a fireplace equals a safe place to have a fire, right? That's the purpose of a fireplace. It's a place where you can put logs together and they can share each other's heat. Anybody see where I'm headed? Christians need a place where their passion can burn brightly, where their passion is encouraged, where their passion is of one person can inflame the passion of another person. Guess what? The church is God's gift of a fireplace for passionate Christians. He gave us the church as a fireplace, a safe place to burn christians who are living with a passion for christ in a world that resists passion need a church you need a church the church is where the love for christ is openly expressed you gotta have a safe place to burn let me tell you something you can't do it by yourself you need a church well, me and Jesus, we got our own thing going on. Let me explain something to you. You need a church. He said, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together, even more so as you see the day approaching. I need you more today than I did yesterday. I got to have a safe place to burn. When my fire starts to dwindle, I need to get next to somebody else who's burning and say, come on, I need you to encourage me. I got to get the fire burning again. I got to get next to somebody else. Come on, you need the church. You need the church. You need the church. I need the church every time the doors are open. I need a fireplace. The second thing is that you got to realize that fire changes its environment. You got to determine that passion absolutely makes a difference. A Christian without passion is like a river without water. It's pointless. Passion energizes the Christian life. Passion gives us an additional focus in life. Without the passion of God in our lives, we will lead a dull and draining existence. Passion is one of the ways that God empowers our lives. Romans 12 and 11 says, Never be lazy in your work, but serve the Lord enthusiastically. Serve the Lord. Passion for God protects me. Watch, you ready? Passion for God protects me from wrongdoing. <laughs> I make a whole lot less mistakes when I've got passion going on in my life. My passion to please him causes me to say no to temptation. My passion for what God wants to happen in my life causes me to instantly recognize any departure from that. <laughs> So you need to realize that fire changes the environment around it. A passion for God is something that will keep me from saying yes to temptation because I so want to please God. That doesn't mean you won't make a mistake. That means you're less likely because when that temptation comes, you're going, no, if that's going to displease God, I don't want to have anything to do with it. 
I want to walk away from it. I, I don't want to have anything to do with temptation. I don't want to have anything to do with that. And so a passion to please God causes you to say no to those things. The third thing is you got to associate with passionate people. Fire needs to be fed. You got to have a good fireplace. You got to have a safe place to burn. And then you also need to associate with passionate people. Fire needs to be fed in order to keep going. You can put logs on a fire and leave them, and guess what? That fire will eventually go out. And so it needs to have more logs to be, it needs to be fed in order to keep growing. If it is true that people affect how we live and how we walk, then it is true that if we spend time with people who are passionate about the Lord, it will cause our hearts to grow brighter. Right? right? Paul reminded his young apprentice again, Timothy, about the power of people to affect his own flame. In 2 Timothy 1 and 5, he said, I am reminded of your sincere faith, which first lived in your grandmother Lois and in your mother Eunice, and I am persuaded that it now lives in you. You got to get yourself around some people who are encouraging. Listen, I love everybody, but I don't want to be around negative people. <laughs> now, we don't have any of those here, but in other places... There are negative people. They're not happy about what's going on. They're not happy about the music. They're not happy about the service schedule. They're not happy about the paint color on the walls. Everything's negative. I can't believe that person's coming to church. If you'd have known them before they came here, there ain't no way God would ever even do something with that person. Listen, I love you, but I don't want to be around you. <laughs> I'm sorry, was I too clear, too transparent? I want to be around people that are going to encourage me. I want to be around people that are going to say, you know what? We may not have it perfect, but man, it's the best thing that we've got going on. And there's no other place I'd rather be than right here in the middle of his presence, in the middle of his power. It doesn't matter. God will touch them. God will deal with it. I really could care less about the pain. Leave that to the ones that know what they're doing. I just want to be in a place where I can worship. I need to be in a fireplace where I can burn, and I need to get around some folks that are encouraging and want to burn also. And then the last thing, I'm close. The last thing is we've got to pray for passion. We've got to pray for passion. See, God's fire, this fire on the inside of us is a gift. 2 Timothy 1 and 6 says, fan and to flame the gift of God which is in you. Stir that up. How would Timothy do that? He did it through prayer. Colossians 4 and 2 says, continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant about it. Earnestly, fervently, be being vigilant about my prayer. These words speak of passion. It's not something simple. It didn't say just pray happenstance. It said you got to pray with purpose. you got to pray with vigilance. you got to pray with, with everything inside of you fervently and earnestly and powerfully. you got to pray. It's not just the now I lay me down to sleep prayer. I don't know about you, but it does something to me when I get in a place with God and I begin to get into his presence and I start calling out some things over the adversary and calling out some things over the enemy. I want you to know something. I've been in some prayer meetings where some of your names have been brought up and I've said, God, by the authority that's in your name and by the power of your presence, I need you to move. I need you to touch. I need you to intervene, God. I need you. There's something about getting in the fire of the Holy Ghost and praying fervently. Can I just say powder puff prayer don't scare the devil? It don't. He ain't nervous. He's not nervous at all. But I'm going to tell you who he is nervous of. Some folks that will straight up get a hold of God. Because <laughs> they're the ones that will take authority over him. They'll put him in his place where he belongs. Listen, I need you to understand something. Quit letting fear dominate your mind and dominate your life. The adversary has no place in your life. I don't think you heard what I said. There's too many of us that allow fear to come against our minds and against our spirits. I'm telling you, the word says, can I give you scripture? God hath not given you a spirit of fear, but of love and power and a sound mind. I'm just going to tell you right now, if you got fear, get the book and start walking around your house and say, by the authority of the name of Jesus, I rebuke every enemy. I rebuke every... My God, somebody needs to hear me. I'm tired of fear dominating me. It don't belong in my life. It don't belong in my home. I will not have it. Quit giving the devil credit. Quit giving the devil room. Tell him, you got no place in my home. You got no place in my family. Get off of my 
kids. Get off of my spouse. Get off of my family. But you know what? It takes some passion. Stand with me. It takes some passion and some fervent prayer to get over authority like that. You've got authority over the enemy. The name of Jesus. Anything worthwhile, any good thought, any inspiration for songs or poems or music, any concern for people comes from prayer. And it comes from having a passion. Nobody writes a song about the lack of passion that I want to have. Nobody writes a song that says, I don't want to pray more. I don't want to serve more. I don't want to be in your house more. Nobody writes songs like that. <laughs> they write songs like, get me in your presence. They write songs like, I want to desire, I desire to be in your house. They sing songs like, there's no place I'd rather be than in the presence of God. They sing songs like we just sang in this place. Do you realize in this place, miracles can happen? Yeah, but Pastor Brother Green's gone. <laughs> you know what? The same God that was here is still here. The, 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 same, the same spirit is still here. The same authority is still here. He's just another vessel that God uses. It's a passion. It's a passion. And prayer is what does it. Prayer is the key to restoring passion in your life. Prayer is the key to restoring passion in your ministry, restoring passion in your marriage, restoring passion in your relationships. John Wesley made this statement. This is my close. I, I wish that all of us could get a hold of this. He was asked one time, John Wesley, he was asked about the secret of his ministry. What's the secret? John Wesley would speak before thousands. And they said, what is the secret of your ministry? Probably looking for some deep theological answer. Probably looking for some silver bullet, some special key, some special uh, uh, formula that would give them that same passion, that same ministry that he had. And he said this. He said, I asked God to set me on fire and then let people watch me burn. It's just that simple. He said, I just want you to set me on fire, God. And then I want people to just watch me burn. Because there is no greater thing that I could be called to than to be passionate about your presence. My prayer this morning is for you, for this church, for my life, for my family, for your family. So we ask God's holy fire. Lord, let it burn in my soul. God, setting everything about me on fire for your kingdom. The problem is, we got so many other things that draw our attention. So many other things that pull us in different directions. There should be one thing that never fades and never changes. And that is my passion. I feel the Holy Ghost in the room right now. I don't know who this was for today. I don't know why you needed to hear it. But I know where God has brought us last week, this first revival of the year. I know the messages that have already been preached this year. My God, he has been speaking to us. I got some special things the next three weeks that I'm going to speak to you about. But I'm telling you, none of this matters. None of what's going on around here matters. None of it matters. I don't have a passion for his presence. So I'm going to make a very simple altar call here today. 
very simple. You can take part if you'd like. If you don't want to, that's fine. You can, you can go on, be dismissed, that's fine. I'm not going to do a formal dismissal this morning. I just want to give you an opportunity. But I, I wonder if across this room we can find a place at the altar. Even if you've got to turn around in a chair because there's not enough room. That's a wonderful thing for there not to be enough room at the altar. <laughs> that means there's a bunch of folks down there. But I don't know about you, I like to get down to the altar, so I will find my way down there. But I wonder if you could come to the altar today, and just like no one else is around, and no one else is in the room, can you get that same desire of a John Wesley that says, you know what, God? I just want you to set me on fire. I, I, just, I just want to have this passion to be in your presence. God, on Sunday morning, when the alarm clock goes off, don't let me get mad. Let me get excited that I get to be in your presence. God, on Tuesday night, when we can come together for prayer, God, let me get excited about being, listen, don't grow comfortable with it. Don't grow familiar with it. But be passionate about being in your presence. God, this is the only thing I want is to be in your presence. So set me on fire, God. Set me ablaze and let others watch me. Let them watch me burn. Come on, I wonder if there's some families. I wonder if there's some parents. I wonder if there's some young people even that would say, you know what, I got to make some decisions about who I hang around with at school and I got to make some decisions about who I let influence me, who I allow to influence my life. I don't want people that are going to put the fire out, but I want people that are feeding the fire. this room can we begin to pray come on all across this room begin to pray